everyone. I welcome in the Matt Bernier Show on DRF TV, live.drf.com, livestream.com, the Daily Racing Forms Twitter handle, that would be at DRF Inside Post, as well as the Daily Racing Forms Facebook page. My name is Matt Bernier. You can follow me on Twitter at Bernier underscore Matt. This is the recap edition of the Matt Bernier Show. This is for the weekend of January the 27th, Pegasus World Cup weekend. If you listen podcast version, you know the drill by now. YouTube, SoundCloud, iTunes, video. Dot drf.com. There's no sense in burying the lead. The first race that we're going to go over this weekend, in the recap anyway, from this past weekend, was the Pegasus World Cup. It was a grade one. It had a purse of $16.3 million. These were the horses that competed in the second annual Pegasus World Cup. The heavy favorite was Gunrunner, the horse of the year in 2017, making his final lifetime start. Some of your alternatives in here included West Coast, and Stellar Wind, and Collected, and Sharp Azteca, and you name it, there were a number of other horses if you were so inclined to try to defeat the big horse. But guess what? The big horse delivered in his final lifetime start. This is a stretch run of the Pegasus World Cup. Top of the stretch. Gunrunner set down for the drive by Florent Giroux. He leads by two. West Coast, the only one with the chance. He's second. Well clear of the others. A battle on for third with Fear the Cowboy coming on. Gunrunner needs another 16th. It's Gunrunner in front. He'll go out a winner. He's the horse of the year. And he's Gunrunner with an unforgettable performance in the Pegasus World Cup. He won by two. Gunrunner wins the Pegasus World Cup, pays $4.20 on top. West Coast goes off as your second choice and runs second. $4 to place. Gunavera, the local horse, coming from well off the pace, $4.80 to show. The $2 exacta, not bad, all things considered, with the first and second choices. $17.20 for two. $1 trifecta, $55.50. The $0.10 cent superfecta, if you included Fear the Cowboy, another late runner for $0.10, cents, that came back $114.27. Gunrunner is now retired. He is a five-year-old, and boy, he did a lot of good things on the racetrack. 19 lifetime starts, 12 times a winner, just under $16 million in career earnings, owned by Winchell Thoroughbreds LLC and Three Chimneys Farm, trained by Steve Asmussen, bred by Bessalou Stables LLC out of Kentucky, ridden to victory by Florent Giroux, and the pedigree by Candy Ride out of a Giants Causeway mare named Quiet Giant. Gunrunner, all he did was show up with legitimate after effort, excuse me, after legitimate effort. He goes out in style with a 119 buyer speed figure and another 140 plus time form US rating to be exact, a 141 time form US rating from Craig Milkowski and the folks at time form. This is really a, a fantastic racehorse that it took me a while to warm up to him. But it's hard to look at his overall body of work and have nothing, anything other than admiration for him. He showed up, he ran, didn't matter the distance, didn't matter where it was, whether it was across the country or across the world, even going over to Dubai and running second over there last year. Gunrunner was just a very, very cool horse. He did things a little bit quirky, you know, whether it was the lead changes, and we saw that in full effect down the middle of the lane there in the Pegasus on Saturday down at Gulfstream, swapping a couple times. Didn't make a difference. All he did was show up and run. He got his final eighth of a mile in just under 13 and one. This was just an all around phenomenal effort, breaking from the outside. A great, great ride from Florent Giroux. Decided to get him into the running early. The fraction set throughout 23 and two, 46 and three, 10 and one for this caliber of racehorse. Nothing ballistic, nothing crazy, but they weren't walking out there either. He got into a good position, pressed the pace throughout, collected the pace setter. He packed it in quite early. Very disappointing effort from him. We'll talk about him and some others here momentarily. But this race was all about Gunrunner. This was sort of the cherry on the top of the Sunday. He was awarded the Horse of the Year earlier in the week, and he goes out in style. Gunrunner is now off to his next career as a stallion. Let's talk about the rest of the field now. Uh, West Coast, I tweeted after the race, I think he's going to be a monster in 2018. That's not really breaking any news. Anybody that watched the race and anybody going into this race is a reason he was your 7-2 to two second choice. But the way that he ran, this to me was far and away the best that he has looked out on the racetrack. Only beaten by 2.5 lengths. He's 10.5 clear of third. The reason I say he's going to be a monster, unless you have a 3-year-old that jumps up in just some dramatic way as the year goes on. You're, obviously, you're not going to see them face one another early on. But as the year goes on, unless there's a three-year-old that just is, turns into some sort of a monster, right now there's no one in the same ballpark as West Coast as far as the older horses are concerned. If you don't think that Collected at any point is going to come back to what he once was, outside of him, 
Who else is there? I mean, Gunavera, nice horse, another good effort here for Antonio Sano. They've talked about possibly going to the Dubai World Cup with him. I mean, we're talking 10 and three quarters lengths between those two horses. And that was at a mile and an eighth. Mile and a quarter is going to be even more to the West Coast's liking. I just don't see anyone right now that's even in the same league. If, if Gunrunner were still around, then you know what? Maybe those two would eventually have some sort of nice little rivalry that would come together. But Gunrunner's gone. Arrogate's gone. Collected doesn't look like he's in now, and he's going to get a freshening. I look at this right now and say West Coast is just head and shoulders above everyone else in this entire older division. And you know what? If that's the case, that's fine. This is going to be a nice sort of passing of the torch if this is how it plays out. It's horse racing. Anything can happen. Bob Baffert after said we're going to get the boys back home. We'll go over. We'll see. We'll let the horses tell us where they're going to go. We nominate everything to Dubai. I would go out on a limb and say that West Coast is probably, if everything looks good, he'll go over to Dubai. Uh, on Odds Checker right now, he is the three to one favorite. Odds Checker is a site that you can go and see what everyone is doing across the world. Uh, he is the three to one favorite, and some of your alternatives in there, his second choices, would include the Mare Forever Unbridled, would include his uncoupled stablemate collected in this spot. So there are a couple things just to keep in mind going forward, but it feels like West Coast. He could be the one. Just as, it, as sad as it is to see Gunrunner go, it could be the beginning of something even bigger and better for a horse like West Coast. Collected, on the other hand, it sounds like Baffert said he's going to get a freshening and then they will consider going back to the turf with him. His past two races, I wanted to make a case for him and say that the San Antonio, nothing more than a prep, he's going to be ready to go. He was terrible in this spot. I understand maybe there was a headwind that they were running into, but just a really, really poor performance from Collected. This is two in a row now. I'll admit I was wrong, and we'll find out. Hopefully, he can get back to his best form after a little bit of a freshening. Gunavera already mentioned, sounds like they're talking about the Dubai World Cup. No reason not to go over there for 12 or 15 million or whatever the purse is now over there. Uh, I think that would be a good spot for him. Fear the Cowboy, really, really nice effort from him. Good on the connections for showing up into a spot like this. Seeking the Soul, I talked about it last week. I think that there's a scenario where... If it's not West Coast, maybe it's Seeking the Soul that kind of takes over as far as the East Coast is concerned. But it's, it sounds like Baffert is pretty intent on having West Coast come to the East Coast in 2018 and run at Saratoga and potentially run at Belmont and those sort of tracks. So uh, we'll have to find out. Maybe this is a scenario where you zig when someone else zags and vice versa. Stellar Wind. Well done, nice career, this buttons it up. Okay, maybe not what everybody had hoped if you were looking for some sort of a Cinderella story, uh, but she's gonna go off and be a mom now. Obviously, we she's done nothing wrong on the racetrack. We'll find out if she ends up being a nice broodmare. Collected, I've talked about ad nauseum. Sharp Aztec is gonna be the, fast, uh, the last one here to discuss as far as this race is concerned. Rad Ortiz said afterward that he broke and he just was not fast enough to get to the front. I had tweeted that it was a perplexing ride because I thought there was absolutely no chance that he could win that race sitting off. If what Arad is saying is accurate, then I, I, I can't say that it was a perplexing ride. It was just more, this is a horse that you had cranked up and ready to go. And everyone was saying that he was coming into this uh, like a million dollars. And what happened? Because you don't just all of a sudden go from sitting on a powder keg to having absolutely nothing in the tank. Maybe they were afraid of the distance. Maybe something happened. I don't know. Nothing more than me sitting here speculating, but that was not. We know Sharp Azteca, and that's not Sharp Azteca. Gulfstream, he's run fine there in the past. That can't be used as an excuse. The distance, probably going to be a problem for him, even if he had ran his best race. But I, I just I don't know what happened here. I would imagine they'll just all regroup, and hopefully he's okay, and hopefully we can see him get back to his best run, because this was far from that. We'll find out. Hopefully we get him back to a one-turn mile at some point in the near future. But to put a bit of a button on it, Gunrunner, he is the horse of the year in 2017. He goes out in style. He ends just under $16 million in career earnings. He wins the second Pegasus World Cup. Flipping all the way back to the very beginning of Pegasus World Cup Day, as far as the stakes action is concerned, race number three on Saturday was for Phillies and Mares going a mile and a half on the turf. This was the field for the La Prevoyante. It was not a large field, but you had an odds-on favor on the outside for Suge McGahee and Apple Betty. I thought coming into the race she was just simply better than everyone else, even considering she was coming off of a short layoff. Boy, was I wrong. This is the stretch run of the La Prevoyante. 
top the top of the stretch. Here's texting, looping up on the outside of Daring Duchess, who tries to fend her off. Two and a half back to Somersault and on the outside in Terralina. Final furlong, texting has the lead. Back to second is Daring Duchess, then Terralina and Somersault. But the 2018 La Provayante will go to texting. Texting, one and a half a length. Daring texting wins the La Prevoyante for Chad Brown, and you get a hefty win mutual on the turf, $16.80 on top. Daring Duchess runs second for Mike Maker, a gutsy effort from this mare, $6.80 to place. The number six, Terralina, rounds out your trifecta, $9.40 to show. $2 exact, it comes back $106.20. $1 trifecta, $368.90. And the 10 cent superfecta, $180.18. Texting is a five-year-old mare. She is trained by Chad Brown. She is owned and bred by Sarah S. Farish out of Kentucky, ridden to victory by Javier Castellano. You see the pedigree with this mare at this point. She is by Candy Ride out of a King Mambo mare named Mumbo Jumbo. And as far as the overall career is concerned, she is three for 12. She is just under $275,000 in career earnings, I will admit. And I said it back during previews, I've never liked texting. I just didn't think she was quite that good. Well, for, look, I'll give credit where credit is due. I mean, Chad on the turf is always dangerous. Javier, very clearly one of the best riders we have in the country, if not the world, helps when the pace heats up a little bit early on for you, as it did in this spot. But she runs the best race of her career. 95 buyer speed figure, 118 time form U.S. rating. She popped back to her left lead late. You saw that at the end. I'm still not the biggest fan of hers, but hey, Credit where credit's due. They got the job done, and I'm not going to sit here and completely bash her. She's a graded stakes winner at this point. Daring Duchess, I, she's growing on me a little bit more. I, I was holding a race at Keeneland back last year that I liked her in, and she couldn't quite get the job done. I had been holding that against her for too long. This was a good effort from her. I like the fact that she went out there, the fractions were legitimate, and she stuck around very, very gamely, only be beaten by three quarters of a length. Um, the big disappointment in this race, very clearly was Apple Betty. Apple Betty, there's a couple things. You can look at it one of two ways and say, well, the fact that she had to rush up to press the pace after just kind of being a little bit mm, slow into gear, and then you see the fractions where they heated it up as far as time form US is concerned, that half mile split was fast, and she was hung three, four wide throughout. Maybe she had some excuses, a little bit short off the layoff. I'm gonna look at it and say, all that is correct, but she still was terrible. She didn't pick her feet up. This is a, a very, very disappointing effort for me from Apple Betty. I think she's going to need to rebound in a big, big way, and it's going to be very difficult. We always talk about it. Hard to take a horse off of a very, very poor effort. At least the benefit that you're going to have here is it'll be second start off the bench whenever she comes back. Let's hope that everything is okay, because this was an uncharacteristically poor, poor effort from Apple Betty. But hats off. Chad Brown, Javier Castellano, they get another graded stakes victory on the turf. The La Prevoyant is theirs with texting. Males version of the La Prevoyant was run later on in the afternoon. That was the W.L. McKnight. Let's take a look at that field. This had a full field of nine signed on. Uh, you could have gone a couple ways in here. Your post-time favorite eventually ended up being Bullard's Alley, who had been running very, very well in his most recent starts, including the Breeders' Cup turf. Then you also had Gold Shield for Shug McGahee, who took some serious money, as well as Oscar-nominated for Mike Maker coming off of a slight layoff. And guess what? That layoff looks like it paid dividends. Here's the stretch run of the W.L. McKnight. Side market off, and they're at the top of the stretch with the lead. Oscar nominated comes away with a two length lead into the clear now, trying to get after him as Bullard Zally on the outside in Gold Shield. Back to fourth, and from last is Nessie. 16th of a mile to go. Oscar nominated the leader. Here's Nessie with the lead push, and between Bullard Zally, it's Oscar nominated. Oscar nominated. Mike Maker is a master at these long distance turf races, and guess what? Spoiler alert. Well, hear from him again later on in this program but first things first oscar nominated wins the wl mcknight down at gulfstream nine dollars forty cents on top the number four nessie runs second six dollars eighty cents to place bullard's alley third as the two to one favorite two dollars eighty cents to show two dollar exact comes back sixty two dollars one dollar trifecta seven four five eighty nine forty and the ten cent superfecta with the four choices the four post time favorites in this spot seven four five three $22.48. Oscar nominated is a five-year-old. He's owned by Kenneth L. and Sarah K. Ramsey, trained by Mike Maker, bred by Mrs. Jerry Ammerman out of Kentucky, ridden victory by Jose Ortiz, and you see the pedigree, Kitten's Joy, out of a theatrical mare, 
And Oscar nominated is 6 of 24 lifetime, and he's at $1.4 million in career earnings. Probably one of the more underrated horses that we have in, in training right now because he very often just shows up and runs his race. Mike Maker, at least, he recognized that maybe there was a bit of an issue or he needed a little bit of a breather because he was quoted afterwards saying he had a hard campaign last year and after the Red Smith he needed a little bit of a freshening, and it paid off. Here you are with a victory, a 98 buyer speed figure for Oscar nominated, a 124 time form U.S. rating, and he is. He's just a cool horse. He shows up and runs his race. He may not be a superstar, but he doesn't have to be a superstar. He's a money machine. He shows up runs great race after great race. Maker alluded to the fact that the next logical step would probably be the Pan American. That's going to be on March the 31st down at Gulfstream. I believe the same distance. So expect to see this horse come back again and run another good race. There's really nothing else to say about him. He shows up and runs. I thought he was much the best in this spot. He was wide basically every step. He came with his run. He stayed on nicely. You had some horses coming from the back of the pack, most notably Nessie, put in a serious bid. I suppose Bullard's Alley and Gold Shield, maybe they were in a little bit of a bump and match down through the lane, but at the end of the day, I don't think anybody was going to catch up to Oscar nominated. A very, very good effort here, and you get a nice win mutual paying off odds of 7-2. to two. The one thing I want to add about this race with Nessie, Nessie is a nice horse that has a very, very serious late turn of foot. The problem is, this is Nessie right here. Nessie doesn't like to win races. He likes to round out your exotics, run second and third. So something always to keep in the back of your mind because this is going to look like a very, very nice effort on paper, and it was. But from a win standpoint, these are the kind of horses that maybe you're better off keying underneath because very rarely are they the ones to go and get their picture taken. But they can help lead you to a nice score if you key them second, third, fourth, fifth, depending on whatever kind of an exotic you are playing. Make no mistake about it. If you're looking to key a horse on all slots, Oscar nominated is that kind of horse. He gets the job done in the WL McKnight. Let's go back over to the dirt. The Fred W. Hooper, a one-turn mile on Pegasus World Cup Day. This was the field that contested the race. He had two scratches. The numbers 9 and 11 were both withdrawn. That left you with a field of 9 signed on. Eventually, your favorite would end up being Tommy Macho for Todd Pletcher. We know this horse's affinity for Gulfstream Park. We know he can run well at the mile distance. The question was, where would he be positioned? How was the racetrack? Would he actually do things the way that he's supposed to do them? Because he's always been kind of a horse that it's a, it's a grind. It's a grind. He's going to hang on his left lead. All this kind of stuff. I tell you what. That's not the Tommy Macho that we saw on Saturday. This is the stretch run of the Hooper. 10 and 3. Up front, Luis Saez shakes up Tommy Macho and has to deal with Conquest Biggie on the outside. These two shoulder to shoulder for an eighth of a mile more. Inside, Tommy Macho greenly hanging on to the lead. One more time in Conquest Biggie. Tommy Macho's almost there and he'll win it. It's Tommy Macho to win the Fred Hooper three parts of a length. Second Conquest Biggie. Third was Tale of Silence, followed by just. Tommy Macho wins the Fred W. Hooper stakes. Pays $6.20 on top as your 2 to 1 post time favorite. The number three Conquest. Conquest Big E, a very nice effort from him to run second, $11.60 to place. The number one tail of silence. He was in a little bit tight, eventually came on with a nice run, $3.40 to show. $2 exacta comes back $84.20. $1 try comes back $168.40. And the 10 cent superfecta, if you included Giuseppe the Great in fourth, for 10 cents, $105.58. Tommy Macho is now six years old. He's trained by Todd Pletcher. He's owned by Paul P. Pompa Jr. Bred by John Liviakis out of Kentucky. Ridden a victory by Luis Saez. And you see the pedigree at the bottom of the page. He's by Macho Uno out of an awesome again mare named Starstream. Six of 19 lifetime, $888,000 in career earnings. Tommy Macho earns a 99 buyer speed figure and a 119 time form U.S. rating here. Gets his final quarter of a mile in 25 and one fifth seconds. I've got to be honest with you, this was the best I've seen Tommy Macho look arguably in his life. I, I don't think I'm going out on a limb to say the best he's looked in years, but this might have been the best race of his life. Maybe not from a speed figure standpoint, but th he looked as smooth and comfortable as he has in God knows how long. The lead change was on point. He dug in game. Saya said afterwards, it was a big effort from him. He exploded when he asked him to run down the lane. Todd said afterward in the post-race quotes, he loves Gulfstream Park. He loves the one-turn miles. We'll probably skip the Hell's Hope, and we'll go to the Gulfstream Park mile. That will be on March the 31st. This is the best he's looked in years. And if this is the horse we're going to get going forward, 
One turn Miles, you know, okay, maybe he's not quite as good as sharp as Tekka, but after what we saw from him in the Pegasus World Cup, I don't know where he stands. Tommy Macho, they have long been trying to get a grade one victory for this horse. I would venture a guess if you see him run on the 31st of March, well, that's not going to be a grade one. There's always time, though. That's the good piece. There's time between now and then. And if you'll recall, not too much after that March 31st race at Gulfstream up at Aqueduct, there's the grade one Carter. And who knows what's going to show up in that race. And we saw how close and how well he ran in last year's Carter, which is a seven furlong race. It's a grade one. We'll find out. Tommy Macho is a cool horse. He's had some major physical issues. The fact that Pletcher has kept him together and kept him as competitive as he has been is just a tip of the cap, and it just goes to show how good Todd Pletcher is in general. Uh, for what it's worth, Time Form US had the opening quarter mile fraction being color-coded as blue, so it was slow, may have favored some of those horses that were close. Really big effort from Conquest Big E. I think the connections need to be thrilled with the way that he ran here. This is probably as good as he is. It was a winning race. He was only beaten three quarters of a length, and he was over, over four lengths clear of the third place finisher in here. So he's a nice horse, nice effort. They're going to collect a nice check out of that race, but make no mistake about it, a big, big effort from Tommy Macho. Have to acknowledge the fact that Beasley was just awful in this spot. And I don't know what the story was. I hope he's okay physically, but he showed no interest early on. Javier started scrubbing on him before they even got to the half mile pole. And this horse was just completely empty. Um, I don't know what you do with him going forward because the bold ruler I'd acknowledged last week in the stakes preview. We know that that number is probably on the inflated side, but I really thought getting back to a high 90 was well within his range. After this race, I'm not sure what you do with him. If you give him a little bit of a breather and you try something different, I'm not sure. But boy, this, this was a major, major disappointment from eventually he went off as your second choice at odds of seven to two. Uh, disappointment from Beasley, but boy, I'm telling you, the best Tommy Macho has looked in years, he wins the Fred W. Hooper. How about we look at the bomb of the day at Gulfstream on Saturday. Race number nine, that was seven-eighths of a mile on the main track, the Hurricane Birdie for older fillies and mares. This was a full field of 12, and your favorite was Curlin's Approval, and we know what Curlin's Approval is capable of doing on her best day. She loves Gulfstream Park. She loves going these sort of one-turn distances, seven-eighths of a mile, a one-turn mile, whatever else it may be. She eventually goes off at odds of eight to five, but boy, this thing ended up being just bombs away because there was one horse in particular that took it all down and set up some some very very nice payouts here's the stretch run of the hurricane birdie Cuts the corner and tries to run with them. Down the outside in Curlin's approval. A late run from long shot Jordan Tenney. Final eighth of a mile. Still many chances. Curlin's approval has the lead. Jordan Tenney trying to get out. If she does, she's dangerous. And here she comes. Jordan Tenney and Tyler Gaffleone surging up to win the Hurricane Birdie. Jordan Tenney gets it. Second was Curlin's approval. Third was Rich Mommy. Then Moonlit. Bombs away. 59 to 1. Jordan Tenney wins the Hurricane Birdie and pays a buck 20 even. And I say buck 20, meaning $120 on top. The number seven, Curlin's approval. The beaten eight to five favorite pays $4 to place. And the number three, Rich Mommy, $7.20 to show. The $2 exacta, 27, comes back $448.80. The $1 try, 273, comes back 1803.80. And the big one, the superfecta for a dime, 27311, comes back $1,539.17. Jordan's Henny is a four-year-old filly. You take a look at all the connections in the pedigree. She's by Henny Hughes out of a Rupiano mare named Sofiano. You see the owner and the breeder, Irv Woolsey and Ralph Kinder. And tremendous training job by Michael A. Tomlinson and a very nice ride from Tyler Gaffleone. Jordan's Henny loves Gulfstream Park. She is 3 of 15 lifetime. She's now over $262,000 in career earnings. In the process, she earns an 88 buyer speed figure in victory here in the Hurricane Birdie. She comes home in 12 and 4. This was her first start off of a pretty significant layoff. You hadn't seen her since September of last year. And uh, Michael Tomlinson talked about it. He goes, you know, we had talked about the idea of starting her back in a much softer spot and then graduating up to a graded stakes race or... Let's just take a shot here. Well, guess what? It was the right call. She earns a 110 time form U.S. rating. Interesting thing about this race as a whole, 
Buyers, we know how the buyers operate. Timeform US factors in the pace scenario, and Jordan's Henny does not earn the fastest Timeform US rating in the field. That belongs to Curlin's approval with a 111 coming out of this race. Rich Mommy, who took advantage of some pace situation, she earns a 108. Moonlit Promise earns a 110. So you can see how all those things fluctuate uh, in stark contrast to the buyer speed figures where the winner is going to have the fastest number. Again, Jordan Tenney earns an 88. Um, strictly a, a speculative motion on my part here. Um, if I'm thinking going forward what the next spot for many of these girls would be, uh, possibly the inside information that's going to be on St. Patrick's Day down at Gulfstream, seven-eighths of a mile. Wouldn't be surprised if you got many of the same faces that show up here, uh, that showed up here running back in that spot as well. Um, because that's really going to be the last opportunity, seven-eighths of a mile for older horses at Gulfstream before everyone kind of disperses, whether you go back to Kentucky. Now, that's the other thing you got to keep in mind as well. At that time, you're probably taking yourself out of consideration for a race like the Madison, which is a grade one at Keeneland. And then, obviously, you're going to have races up here in New York and elsewhere all over the place. So uh, it'll be interesting to see where many of these girls show up again. The one horse I do want to touch on, uh, most importantly, outside of the winner, Jordan's Henny, uh, is Marley's Freedom. Marley's Freedom, the connections have got to be bitterly disappointed that she stumbled as badly as she did at the beginning of this race coming in from Southern California. She was the second choice, just under five to two. Uh, she ran just fine, all things considered. She runs six, but that's not really her running style. She likes to be a little bit more forward into the running. Uh, do not hold this run against her. She's going to look bad based on this running line, but there's much more to that story. You can go into Formulator and pull up the entire replay. She stumbled considerably at the beginning. Don't hold that against her. Marley's Freedom is a better horse than what we saw on Saturday. But all credit is due to Jordan's Henny and her connection. She gets the job done in the Hurricane Birdie with an 88 buyer. Let's shift our focus north to Aqueduct here in New York on Saturday. This was the field for the 7 eighths of a mile toboggan stakes. The headliner was Takafel, making his first start since the Breeders' Cup sprint out at Del Mar. 7 eighths of a mile off the bench, never an easy thing to do, particularly when you're a speed horse and there's a horse called Green Grotto entered because we know one thing about Green Grotto. He's got big, big speed early on. And guess what? Those two threw it down and it's set up for a horse coming from off the pace. Here's the call of the toboggan. Five seconds, Takafel and Green Grotto, Green Grotto and Takafel, and here come the rest of them, and here comes great stuff on the outside, now to take over the lead with an eighth of a mile to the finish, great stuff is in front. Takafel trying to hold on for a second, Vulcan's Forge coming from way out of it, making a late run, but too late, it's great stuff to win the toboggan, and it was close for a second between Vulcan's Forge. Great stuff gets a great pace set up and comes on with a nice finish. It gets the job done in the toboggan for David Jacobson. Pays $25.80 on top. Vulcan's Forge also coming from well off the pace. $8.30 to place. Takafel beaten as the 1-2 to two favorite. He did all the dirty work and just a little bit too much early on. He runs third, $2.10 to show. The $1 exacta comes back $77. The 50 cent trifecta comes back $96.12. And the 10 cent superfecta, $46.15. Great stuff is six years old. I've already mentioned he is trained by David Jacobson, ridden to victory by Dylan Davis. You see the rest of the connections there. He's by Quality Road out of a Hennessy mare. He's over $408,000 in career earnings. He is seven of 26 lifetime. And he's also finished second or third on 12 different occasions. Great Stuff earns a 102 buyer speed figure here in the grade three toboggan. And uh, I, look, I've always liked this horse. And, and anyone that made any money on him Saturday, uh, you're welcome. Because I did not bet him this time around. And naturally, this is when he gets the job done with me off of his back. Uh, just only having Dylan Davis that got the job done. Uh, came home in 12 and 4. It really does help, though, when the two horses that figure to show pace do both show pace, and they throw it down here over this racetrack on 45. The way that it's been playing in recent weeks, uh, that was a blistering early pace, and you could tell, obviously, with Vulcan's Forge coming with that big late finish. Uh, Takafel is probably the horse you want out of this race because he did all the dirty work. He got tired late, got run down by a couple of horses that had perfect pace setups. I think this is probably a nice stepping stone to something else for Takafel, probably going a little bit shorter than the seven-eighths of a mile. I think he's probably best suited at six furlongs. A horse we know that seven-eighths is what he wants is great stuff. Doug Jacobson, the assistant to David Jacobson, and this is his distance. We think he's most effective here, and Dylan rode him great.
Good effort from great stuff. He has shown up and run in some big spots, and he's run against some good horses in New York as well as in Maryland. Uh, he deserved a good run like this. And the 102 buyer, big, big figure. We'll find out where we see him next. Possibly a scenario where you see him in a race like the Carter. That would be, again, at the beginning of April. Uh, I believe it's run on Wood Memorial Day, so we'll see. But there could be certainly plenty of races between now and then for a horse like great stuff. He gets the job done in the toboggan. Shifting from Saturday to Sunday, let's go down to Sam Houston. They had a couple of graded stakes races. Let's start off with the girls. It's the Houston Ladies Classic. This was a grade three event going a mile and 16th on the main track. You had a field of eight signed on. Your post-time favorite was the number seven actress coming in from New York. She ultimately went off at odds of four to five. Your second choice in here was the number two martini glass at odds of five to two. I didn't think that this thing would completely come apart the way that it did, but it did, and it set up for a big, big price. Here is the stretch run of the Houston ladies. Dream outside here. Actress widest of all, and then comes Tiger Moth. They're in the stretch. A lot of chances here. As Sandy Surprise goes to the lead, and Actress is right there. Some congestion as Martini Glass dives right to the inside, and here's Tiger Moth. Tiger Moth on the extreme outside. Actress, Tiger Moth, Sandy Surprise. It is going to be Tiger Moth. Tiger Moth gets up in the Houston Ladies Classic. The last move was the winning move in the Houston Ladies Classic. Tiger Moth gets the job done. Pays $36.30. I'm sorry, $36.60 on top. The number seven actress is beaten as the four to five favorite. $2.60 to place. And the number two martini glass runs third. $2.80 to show. $2 exact to eight seven comes back. 83.20, two dollar try comes back 325.40, and the 10 cent super factor comes back 75 dollars 78 cents. Tiger Moth is a six year old mare at this point, and she runs the career best race for her. Uh, she is over 642 thousand dollars in career earnings. She is six of 22 lifetime. She is trained by Brad Cox. She is owned and bred by John D. Gunther, based in Kentucky. Florent Giroux was the rider in the pedigree. She is by Street Sense out of a Sir Cat mare named Saratoga Cat. 93 buyer speed figure in victory here for Tiger Moth. Again, the last move was the right move and the best move. She gets the best of actress. Uh, you can look at this in a couple of different ways. I look at this race, just looking at that chart right there that we have up on the screen. You can very clearly see that this race completely melted down. Now, the fractions didn't look all that fast, but clearly it was a hot and heavy pace where things just completely fell apart, uh, which means that I kind of feel like Tiger Moth had everything go her way, and wherever she shows up next, I'm not going to be in a rush to be betting her unless there's going to be another potential pace meltdown. Uh, according to Brad Cox, she's going to go back to New Orleans, and he said, thinking out loud, we'll talk about the Azari, which will be run at Oaklawn Park on March the 17th. I think this race completely came apart. Actress, I, I'm disappointed with it. She was wide throughout, but... She really had every opportunity, and she got a little bit tired at the end there. I think she is still one to keep an eye on going forward. She should move forward. Keep in mind, she was stuck here in New York in the midst of all the bad weather and in the midst of the quarantine issue that was happening at Belmont Park. So a number of things working against her. Still a little bit disappointed. Thought she should have run better than she did. If there's one horse I'm anxious to take a look at coming out of this, it is Sandy Surprise. Because Sandy Surprise, I think now in two consecutive races has been up against it a little bit. This spot here, she was the one to make the first move on the far turn. She took over, she was about a length clear at the top of the lane, and she got a little bit tired at the end, but she wasn't embarrassed. She was only beaten by less than two lengths, considering she made the first move into the teeth of the pace. I think it was a good effort there. And then going back to her prior effort, I thought she ran just fine. Uh, she was wide throughout on a day that I think and inside was advantageous at Santa Anita Park. So I think there's a couple things working for Sandy Surprise. Maybe she's one that you want to throw in a DRF horse watch for the next time she shows up, wherever that is. I would imagine she'll probably end up going back to Southern California. And then the problem then becomes are you going to run into the likes of Unique Bella and even Paradise Woods and, and possibly your uncoupled stable mate, Mopatism. But long story short, Tiger Moth, she gets the job done. 93 buyer speed figure for Brad Cox. And Florent Giroux, back-to-back -back days, graded stakes races, won the Pegasus World Cup, and he wins the Houston Ladies Classic. The other graded race on Sunday down at Sam Houston was the John B. Connolly Turf Cup. Let's take a look at that field. The headliner was Bigger Picture, the winner of this race last year from Michael Maker. But you had some other interesting runners in here, as well as two other Maker-trained horses, including Camelot Kitten. But you had a number of other choices in this spot. Chicago Style for Tom Proctor figured to take a good beating in here. And you had some other interesting opportunities if you thought that possibly Bigger Picture would need one off the bench. But guess what? 
the old boy was ready to go and he gets the job done. Here's the stretch run of the Connolly Turf Cup. In high gear, widest of all on the outside as they straighten away. Harlan Strong on the inside. Bigger picture, three deep. Summon time from between horses. Chicago style on the far outside, trying to run them down. Bigger picture, summon time. Bigger picture gets the lead here. Jose Ortiz as they come to the wire. Bigger picture takes it. Bigger picture by a length, tight for second there. Some in time. Or Bigger picture prevails as the four to five favorite pays three dollars eighty cents on top. The number eight, Some in TMA, runs second, nine dollars sixty cents to place. And the number seven, Chicago Style, two dollars eighty cents to show. The two dollar Exacta, nine eight, comes back thirty six twenty. Two dollar Try, nine eight seven one forty sixty. And the ten cent Superfecta, nine eight seven one, comes back thirty one dollars. 30 cents. Bigger picture is seven years old now, but he's still going strong from Michael Maker. This is a nice horse. He's won 11 of 29 lifetime starts. He is over $1.1 million in career earnings for his owner, Three Diamonds Farm. He was bred by Ken and Sarah Ramsey in Kentucky, ridden to victory by Jose Ortiz. And you see the pedigree at the bottom of the page, a badge of silver out of an honor and glory mare named Glory Dancer. 96 buyer speed figure for bigger picture in winning, winning the John B. Connolly Turf Cup. Came home in 23 and 4. This was a good starting off point. Mike Maker said this was a logical starting off point for bigger picture because he won this race last year. Uh, and for what it's worth, here's a little bit of a fun fact. Mike Maker has won this race six of the seven years. These most recent seven years, I should say. Six times in seven years he has won the John B. Connolly Turf Cup. Uh, I thought it was a very good effort from him. He sat relatively close to the pace, waited, followed, summoned TMA into the running, tipped out, came with his run, perfectly timed ride by Jose Ortiz. That's why he won the Eclipse Awards champion jockey last week down at Gulfstream in the Eclipse Awards. Good effort all around. I have nothing bad to say about Bigger Picture. He's a cool horse. I like it when these old blue-collar boys go out there, they show up, they run their race, and they maintain their form. Well done, Mike Maker. Summon TMA. Tip of the cap to Kenny McPeak, getting him back into his best form. You saw how late he was to change leads. I don't think that cost him the victory. I just think bigger picture was better than him this day. But a big effort out of him at 14-1. to 1. And if they can keep him sound, maybe this is a horse that can make some noise in some of these races coming up as well. And Chicago style, I, I think he's a nice horse. The problem is he is that confirmed true one-run closer. He's going to need a serious pace, probably a race that doesn't have a horse that has that sort of tactical uh, advantage and can also kick just as well the Chicago style can, like a bigger picture. That's always going to put him up against it. Um, I, I think there's a race for him somewhere. He's just going to need everything and all the stars to align. But he is a nice horse, and he can still take another step forward. He's a lightly raced five-year-old. Um, all things considered, I have no knock against the top three at all. I think Camelot Kitten's probably not quite this good. I still maintain he's probably better at a little bit of a shorter distance. He came home in 24-3, and three, earned an 89 buyer in his first start for Mike Maker. But all things considered, this is another good effort from Bigger Picture. And the Connections have done a very good job looking for realistic spots for this horse to go out there and show his stuff. He's a cool old horse. I wish him nothing but the best. I like him. He gets the job done in the John B. Connolly Turf Cup. We had a number of other stakes races this weekend. There are just way too many to get done and go through and do a little bit of a deep dive recap. So what do we do? We throw it together in a montage. You're going to get racing from all over the country, including Santa Anita and Gulfstream. Here is this weekend's stakes montage. Leader from Smoky Image coming, no Del Pariso finishing well. The big train is looking for room. Now accountability and Raya coming on. He will has to switch across heels. Coming, no Del Pariso has the lead. Accountability bursting through on his inside. Then comes Rai. It's accountability on the inside. Rai and coming, no Del Pariso. Rai or coming, no Del Pariso. On terms with Miss Sunset at the 316th. Run for Rats even wider. How unusual is making up ground in the middle of the pack. Barbara Beatrice swings wide. How how about zero heads miss sunset inside the eighth pole they're clear of run for rats how unusual and barbara beatrice how about zero striding away how about zero wins by two and a half lengths seconds very close either barbara beatrice or miss sunset Edwards going left who straightens for the run to the judges under the whip by two and a half lengths b squared's coming home gamely tough sunday next followed by solid wager it's Edwards going left, going great guns with a 16th left to run. Edwards going left by five lengths at the wire from B squared and Tough Sunday.
Fourth in the race, Solid Wager. Taking off Heels Campaigner last, 3.16 to go. Bookie's Luck joined by Vutzak. Couple of lengths to Sir Valentine and heck yeah. Psycho Dar on the outside is next from Raven Creek. It's Bookie's Luck and Vutzak tackled by heck yeah, who's come from a long way back. Off an easy debut win on dirt. This is a very promising type. Heck yeah has ambled through the last 16th to win by three. Psycho Dar And sending Sylphide to the parking lot as they swing in. Girls, no best, tries to repel the challenge from Blue Bahia. Just talking, charging hard from third, then just a lady on the outside. Blue Bahia is being eased, a late run from Pretty Perfection, as Girls, no best is clear to the finish. Girls, no best, in front. Just talking second, Cherry Lodge third, then just a lady and pretty boy. Perfect. Gonna try to get to the top pair third, but it's the local horses who turn first with the lead. Successful native by two. Pay any prices all in. Rainbow Air motors down the center with a late run from Oak Bluffs. Also right there is Richard Boy, but Rainbow Air kicking away with authority. Rainbow Air and Irad Ortiz Jr. to win the Gulfstream Park Turf Spread. Oak Bluffs clear now. Second. She's up the inside from third. Storm the Hill is next. Celestine let go and Stormy Victoria from last. She's exploding for Joel Rosario with less than an eighth of a mile to go. Here's Stormy Victoria, who storms to the lead from Celestine, who's right with her. These two, but Stormy Victoria goes last to first to win. She won three parts of a length from Celestine. Was lane very wide, then Jimmy Bouncer. Three sixteenths from home, it's Calculator from the critical way, perfectly majestic. Fly to Mars on the inside. Calculator arriving at the 16th pole, a one length leader from Fly to Mars and perfectly majestic. It's Calculator still in front. Calculator Calculator, the leader from Perfectly Majestic and Fly to Mars and Calculator, three for three down the hill. Fly to Mars getting into second from Miller exact. There is the stakes montage from this past weekend. For what it's worth, I'm sure some of you saw, whether you saw it live or you just saw it there in the montage from the ladies turf sprint down at Gulfstream. You saw Blue Bahia take a very awkward step and Paco Lopez did a very good job to pull her up immediately. Uh, for what it's worth, Jason Service has said that she has come back, that she scanned clean. She's good to go, just a, an unfortunate situation for her in the connections. She took an awkward step down there and it's been well documented what some people think of the turf course down at Gulfstream. I'm not gonna dive into that conversation right now, but it's good to know that she is okay. Blue Bahia, just a scary moment, a couple of awkward steps, but she's good to go. Um, as we always do here on the recap edition of the Matt Bernier Show, we dive back in to this past weekend and we see who were the best performances from a buyer speed figure standpoint. Doesn't matter age, gender, distance, surface, whatever it may be. So here you are. These are the best performances from this past weekend. Three year old male still having fun earned a 92 buyer and stakes race at Laurel Park on the dirt. The three year old females on the dirt, Stormy Meister, earns an 81 buyer down at Gulfstream on Sunday afternoon. Older males on the dirt, here's a surprise, Gunrunner. He goes out in style with a 119 buyer speed figure. Older female, Stellar Wind, goes out in style in the Pegasus World Cup as well. She earns a 94 buyer. And as far as the turf is concerned, for three-year-old males, you saw heck yeah. He looks like he's an interesting one. Going down the hill, winning that stakes race out at Santa Anita. We'll find out ultimately how far he wants to go. Three-year-old females on the turf, Ameritum, 78 buyer. Older males, Rainbow Air is now retired. He is done, and he goes out as a winner as well with a 105 buyer speed figure. And Stormy Victoria, one of the two-headed monster, the exacta for Christophe Clement in the South Beach. She earns a 98 buyer speed figure on the turf for the older females. There you have it. Those are the weekend's best performances from a buyer speed figure standpoint. DRF TV schedule. Those of you that are hard of seeing or slight of seeing, however you word that, uh, myself included. Now, guess what? Look at this schedule. It's a heck of a lot easier to read than what we've seen recently. Uh, you can see we've already, if you're watching this live on Tuesday, you're in the midst of seeing this right now. You'll have the GRF Breeding Report and all sorts of good stuff up there from Dan Illman and Nicole Russo. And you can see as we go on throughout the week on Thursday, you're going to get the Watchmaker Watch. You're going to get all sorts of good stuff. You're also going to have the uh, all you know the DRF Bets race of the day all throughout the week. Uh, you name it, it's out there. You're going to have the Holy Bowl. You're going to have the Robert B. Lewis. You're going to have all sorts of different stakes races. Now, on Friday, Peter Thomas Fornitale and Jonathan Kinchin, they're going to be going at 2.30. 2.30 live. They're going to be going over a tournament, DRF Tournaments Live. That'll be interesting and fun to go over, and obviously we'll get you guys ready to go for the weekend Friday on this show, the Matt Bernier Show. That will be at noon Eastern, as well as the latest edition of Out of the Gate.
Uh, without further ado, we're going to button things up here on the recap edition of the Matt Bernier Show. If you've been watching live, live.drf.com, livestream.com, thank you for doing so. You've also got Daily Racing Forum social media that also streams this program. If you want to follow me on Twitter, call me an idiot, say I'm great, and whatever else, anything in between, at Bernier underscore Matt. If you listen to this thing podcast, YouTube, SoundCloud, iTunes, video.drf.com. Best of luck the rest of the weekdays anyway until... We meet again on Friday, again, noon Eastern, if you're watching live, and the podcast will be up shortly thereafter. Best of luck for the rest of the week. Chat again on Friday. This has been the Matt Bernier Show.